Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Our group promotes the advancement of social capital theories and, and we support anyone who wants to use the concept in, in research or practical application. Uh, we have members from about 130 countries and an active discussion group with over a thousand members and we hold regular webinars with invited speakers. In this session, we welcome Professor Sandra Rosas for a presentation and discussion about the determinants of social capital in organisations. Professor Sandra Rosas uh, is a professor at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico and a doctoral candidate in the Management Sciences program. She holds a master's degree in business and economic studies and a bachelor's degree in management from La Salle University. She is currently the co-founder and director of the Center of Research and Sustainable Innovation, which promotes social capital, innovation, uh, sustainable impact in organizations. She is a researcher and a consultant, um, advisor for high-level business decision-making and public policies, uh, a specialist in the direction of economic and business research groups in the following areas, market competitiveness, entrepreneurship, and innovation. So it's wonderful to have you today uh, for this webinar, Sandra, and over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Tristan. Thank you so much to permit me to present the results of my findings that I have been working the last four years, almost, and I want to congratulate you to you, to Marian, for this amazing job that you have done in the last years. Thank you so much. And now we are going to present the analysis of determinants of social capital in organization uh, methodological review. Okay. See, okay, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And what are we looking at? Considering that social capital and collaborative networks contribute to improving the current situation COVID-19 affects, the research provides information to strengthen the determinants of social capital in organizations and review of various methodologies aimed at providing a structure to collaborative networks. Wait me one minute, I'm going to take off the WhatsApp because I was listening, okay. Okay, the content is the summary contextual framework, theoretical framework, problem statement, research questions, objectives, hypothesis, justification, proximate activities, and reference. But at first, I would like to tell you what is this proposal. And I want to, to see the context that what is the current situation in my country? Um, what at first we have here the effects of COVID-19 and the organizations in Mexico have not been able to generate a scaffolding for their efforts to generate a better performance indicators. Currently, there is a climate of uncertainty and general distrust due to increase in the level of criminality and low level of trust derived from opportunistic behaviors aimed at obtaining individual rather than collective benefit, affecting business activities in the country. Okay, individuals have been damaged by fraudulent practices an opportunistic behavior, which has led to a low level of trust that affects their willingness to work collaboratively, resulting in low levels of innovation and economic performance, and even the disintegration of their organizations. But at first, I want to show you some important indicators that I related with social capital. And I would like to present the Global Competitiveness Index that it was made by World Economic Forum. These indicators uh, provide us each year and they evaluate 12 pillars. One of the most important pillars here is the enabling 
environment. And we have in the number one, the pillar one is institutions. Okay, and here we are. Out of 140 countries, uh, Mexico is in the place 46. But the, if we are focusing in the indicators that we need, that it's institutions, we could have here that out of 140, we are in the place 98. This pillar includes security, social capital, checks and balance, public sector performance, and transparency. And in security, we are in the place 138. And if we focus, if we focus in organized crime, we are in 140 out of 141 countries. Uh, of course, homicide rate 129, um, uh, terrorism incidents 103. For example, in social capital, we are in 121. And I don't know, freedom of the press, we are in the place 180. And transparency incidents of corruption are, we are in 116. Okay, the Global Competitiveness Index in 2020, the World Economic Forum, this is for the, took the, decided to build a different metric in, because the COVID-19, the effects of COVID-19. The institutions evaluate the capacity of countries to make economic transformation and effective social and institutional system to positively counteract the effects. And the performance with the score from zero to 100, Mexico is rated in the place number 36. Out of 37 countries that the World Economic Forum evaluated, we are in the place 36. What is the danger if we continue with the same dynamic in Mexico? And in my opinion, we can expect that the institutions build or do the correspondent activities to build the social capital. That is the reason that my purpose is to build the social capital from micro to macro level. Here we have some concepts of social capital for international uh, institutions, but I want to focus here in that Nahapiel and Goshal, Nahapiel and Goshal provide us about social capital as the sum of actual and potential resources embedded within, available through, and derived from the network of relationships possessed by individual or social unit. Okay, we have three dimensions that they provide us. Okay, is overall pattern of connections between actors, the structural dimension, overall patterns of connection between actors, that is, who you reach and how you reach them, presence or absence of the network ties between the actors, networks, or morphology, describing the patterns of linkages in terms of such measure, density, connectivity, and hierarchy, and appropriate organization that is existence of networks. Hierarchy. Okay, relash, relational dimension describes that kind of personal relationship people have developed with each other through a history of interactions. And this concept focuses on the particular relations people have, such as respect and friendship that influence the behavior. And we have the cognitive dimension, 
refers to, for those resources providing shared representations, interpretations, and systems of meaning among parties. Okay, we have some fundamental aspects that we have to study with social capital that is trust, risk of opportunity behavior, negotiation or transaction cost that provide, that it was provided by Williamson, an economic uh, area, uh, cooperation and information flow. Okay, this is a theoretical framework that I was reviewed in social capital, Coleman, Burtman, Lin, and Hapiet and Rocha, economic theories like agency theory, transaction cost theory, and game theory, like cooperative games, network approach, like Ronald Burt, Nan Lin, and of course you, Tristan Courage. 2018 and corporate governance theories, stakeholder capitalism theory, stewardship, is um, Porter about the view of the importance of historical and cultural approach. Okay, my assumption, social capital is the assets of resources that exist in the relations embedded in the networks. If we have positive relations, our level of social capital increases. Network need collaboration to have a positive impact. If we took the main factors to have an, an effective collaboration along with other elements to increase the power, we could increase the level of social capital and we could have a sustainable impact. Okay, now we are going to review the main factors of collaboration that provide us uh, Matesi et al. And this is from what does collaboration works. And he proposed the uh, 20 factors and are a group in six dimensions. Environment, membership characteristics, process and structure, communication, purpose, and resources. And uh, let me see where it is. Uh, proposed by me is the corporate governance and, of course, increase the trust. But I want to show you how Matesic et al. see the collaboration. For example, if we compare the concept or the vision and relationships between cooperation and, co and collaborations. The cooperation, the basis is the missions and objectives of the organization are not taken in a, into account. O okay, different organizations, uh, they have their own missions and objectives and action is on as needed basis may last indefinitely. Collaboration, the commitment of the organization and their leaders fully supports the representatives. New missions and shared objectives are created. One or more projects are undertaken for long-term results. Okay. They are proposing a build a new organizational structure between the networks or clearly defined and interrelated functions are created that constitute a formal division of labor. Okay, um, more extensive planning is required, including joint strategies and measuring success in terms of impact on the needs of the people serve. Beyond communications, functions, and channels of interaction, many layers of communications are created as clear information is the cornerstone of success. Okay, uh, well, here is it, associationism and corporate governance, because we have to build the norms. We have to build the conductal, uh, the conduct behavior. That is the, the reason that I put the corporate governance. The corporate governance uh, seek 
their ethical conduct, uh, transparency to increase the trust. That is the reason that it's really important to include corporate governance in the analysis of the determinants of social capital. And here we have the six dimension, trust and associationism and corporate governance. Okay, here I have the objective, general objective to find the determinants of social capital in organization, as well as the main methodological consideration in order to encourage it in organizations. And here we have the objective specific to expose the key determinants of social capital at the microeconomic level, according to the eight dimension analyze. Um, determine which determinants have the highest explanatory level at the inter-organizational and organizational levels. Okay, we did, well, I did, the sample 299 companies were taken as a sample for this research apply to general directors, area businessmen, administration, and teachers located in the state of Jalisco. And the questionnaire, which is made up of 41 questions composed of three models. At the beginning is training innovation because we are, well, in fact, I am looking for the dependent um, variable and research and finally the level of corrible operation and social capital. In order to measure the consistency of the variables to be evaluated, as well as the reliability of the data collection instrument, the Cronbach Alpha test was performed to obtain uh, 0.931 and taking the data collection instrument as effective. The results show Okay, the results show that the factors are consistent in most of the analyzed dimensions. Since even when not all the factors obtain high indicators, it is established that the best evaluate components are those that are related, related to the environment, characteristic of the member, the membership's characteristics, process and structure, communication, purpose, and the resources. And the worst evaluated are the trust item being able to derive, derive sorry, that the analysis of this dimension is related to the factors are, that are as external. Okay, this is the matrix of components. Uh, we have the, the seven parts and the subject, uh, where we apply this questionnaire. Okay, to the production chain, Agave Mezcal in Aguascalientes too, and executives and managers of companies established in Jalisco, Mexico. Okay, now we are going to review the methodological review. Now I would like to present you the transformative change making. This is an amazing methodology that was provided by Saxer. He works in Frederick Ever Stiftung, is an important institution in Germany. And he works with um, um, apocalyptic situations in India. Okay, the process that give us Saxer is the, at first, the, all the stakeholders of the project, they have to interact and they have to build their idea then they have to build the narrative that it's so powerful because the members of the NAF of collaborations, they build a better future than the current 
the currently, they made the proposal, disclosure and implementation. Okay, now here I made an analysis with the theoretical framework provided by Matesic et al. with the three dimensions and I built two with the six dimensions provided by, by Matesic. And here we have, for example, they evaluate in environment, history of collaboration, the group detects a legitimate leader and favorable and political and social claim. Climate, for example, in the dimension of relational, mutual respect, understanding, and I made this uh, classification and this analysis of this. It's important to say that these methodologies that I used, all I related with networks. But I think as, um, that it could work in in, inside the organization too. Okay, here we have the cognitive dimension and structure. Yeah, okay. And the last April 2020, uh, I made a pilot, a proof in an organizational view or scope to, the, to a community of women entrepreneurs until today. And an organizational and interorganizational entrepreneurship academic. This is in, in a specific area of entrepreneurship academy in the University of Guadalajara. This is from August, August 2020 today. What did I do? Okay, I tried to um, build social capital. This is the process that I proposed and that I made and I have um, positive results. Okay, we have here the personal development. Okay, here we are all the process, three sessions are held in which the individual is made aware of the collaboration and is asked to complete an initial questionnaire on his or her current situation. Then I made a diagnosis, a Micmac diagnosis. This is a um, matrix of correlation to find the main problem that they have um, in that way, the woman or the academic personnel could focus to solve that problem in the in, in short term. Okay, then the third, I made a project. This document determines the scope and objectives of the project being developed by the group. I built a code of a code of conduct because here in Mexico uh, we are not used to have um, or to follow all the norms inside our well maybe yes inside in their organization but no in the interorganizational way. Okay, the group mission, vision, and regulations are established in order to reach agreements that can be observed and complied by, with by the members. Then I confirmation the, the confirmation of the note, the business model, basic research, and session of an effective magnetization. Okay. Here is the process, the key problems to be addressed were identified. 
this is the participatory diagnosis. Then the project, project objectives, assumptions, restrictions, and stakeholder analysis as Maxer established, Saxer established. Scope, mission, and vision, a code of conduct was established, and the communication that the node could have is determined. And then this is the test pilot that, uh, of course, we applied the survey to, to the women entrepreneurs. And I would like to tell you that the, in 2020, when we are in the confinement and at first the entrepreneurial women entrepreneurs doesn't didn't know uh, a clear path to follow in in that situation of COVID-19 uh, they have for example in 2021 and 2020, the highest, because the first uh, problem that they addressed was sales, were sales, and they have the highest level of sales. And this is, thank you so much. I don't know if. Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, interesting presentation and certainly good to explore some of those details. Uh, so we'll we'll have questions um, now from, from the audience if anyone would like to, to pose some questions. I thought I might start with the, the first one, Sandra. Um, using the uh, dimensions approach, the structural, relational, cognitive dimensions building on from Napier and Goschel, um, do you find it useful or do you use the, the extension of the structural dimension that Norman Uphoff proposed to include things like roles and rules and precedents and procedures in the structural dimension? So my question is kind of twofold. One, do you use that approach that Norman Uphoff um, proposed? And do you think it is useful to include those kinds of things in the structural dimension? I think that it could be very important to include it. I don't know about Norm is the name of the okay. Uh, Norman Uphoff. Uphoff Norman was the Uphoff. I yeah. didn't uh, review, but if you can give me the information, I think that it could be amazing. Yeah, because I, I find it quite interesting that um, you know Napier and Goschel they define the structural dimension as the the configuration of networks, basically. Uh, you know, really focusing on the, the sort of network components of it. And, and Uphoff was able to, or suggested that, that it be extended, particularly looking at organizations to include the sort of structural elements of an organization, such as, you know, roles and, and rules and so forth. And I've seen that being used quite often in the literature, but I, but I haven't seen anybody particularly extend Uphoff's um, description of, of these things and how they might work within the context of, of that dimensional approach. Okay. But yes, it, thank you so much. I can include it. Yeah, but it might be something for other people as well who are interested to, to explore that and see um, how they think it might, might fit and how it might work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so should we move on to questions from the audience? Um, so a few people have posted questions into the chat, which we can we can get to, um, but also feel free to put up your hand as well uh, within Zoom and we'll try and get to your questions as we go through. So Marion, do we have anybody here who's, who's asked a question? Uh, I've been so fascinated by what Sandra had to say that I actually haven't checked Tristan, but I think that the first question is a general one that could you recommend a questionnaire? Um, and you're calling that the um, Big Mac questionnaire? Uh, yes, Big yes. Mac. It's an amazing diagnosis. Yes, and this is a matrix with uh, you can correlate the problems and you can find the main problems of the group Good. with participation of all of them. At first, you have a do a start with the um, uh, brain uh, storm. 
mm -hmm. with the brainstorm and all the participants could um, extern and they feel that they are participating and the, the, the voice, their voice is, is heard. Contributing, yeah. yes, yeah. to solve yeah. the questions yeah. or to solve the problem. And this is the instrument you've developed, the Micmac? No, I didn't. Uh, I think that there is, well, maybe I can show you. Do you want to see it? Yeah. yeah. Or maybe nothing, I can nothing. send to you. <laughs> or maybe I can send to you, Miriam. I would like to show you how it works. Yeah. Uh, it's an amazing instrument. Yeah, well, I think we'd, a lot of us would love to see that. Yeah, and so that's the predominant questionnaire that you've actually utilized? Yes, I can send you to the questionnaire that I use to analyze, and of course, all the data that I collected, of course. Yep, yeah. I think that's what sort of the first question came up about the actual measurement. I mean, mine comes later about how do we actually disseminate this throughout uh, throughout the organizational context, et cetera. But I think the questionnaire and the validation, which is one coming out of your research, is the one that people are really quite interested in. Um, and that was Igor from Hungary, who I'm not too sure is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the next question was from um, Ethiopia, from Fetterhun. He said, how do you differentiate or how does that Micmac differentiate measurements of structural and relational dimensions of social capital? So does it well, set them in a structure? The yeah. Well, the Micmac only, uh, the only thing that you are going to have with the Micmac is the problems that they are affecting to the group. Hmm. And it could apply to the, all the stakeholders and all the different perceptions of the interns, yes, of the group, yes. So the interpretations you can place on it um, are what are the structural constraints on the group and the relational constraints on the group as well? Yes, so you train the relations right. because it's sometimes when you are debating one problem, Mm -hmm. Maybe in your perception, the main problem, it could be the institutions. And maybe if, from my point of view, it's the, the community, okay? Yeah. The, the valuable thing that you can find with the Micmac, it's that all are, uh, all consents, about what is the main problem. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. You um, nice. ask of the group and you tell, okay, uh, this pro if we solve this problem, we can um, solve this, 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 and this. Yes, no, yes, no. And in fact, you are uh, pondering. Waiting, you are. Waiting. Are you waiting things? Yeah, yes. relatively to or prioritizing which are the bigger. You are prioritizing. Yeah. If you want, then maybe I can show you. I don't yeah. know if we have enough time to show you the. Uh, I'll leave that with Tristan. Or maybe yeah. another session. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if, and then we see how we go for time, and if yeah. there is is time after we have a few more questions, maybe we can have a look. Okay. This, the third question that was asked before the seminar started was about coalitions and being able to track how the coalitions in the organisations, how they actually interact. But maybe we could leave that question until further. Tristan, I'll hand back to you, Tristan, now. Well, yeah, so the question from Jesus from Colombia, um, I'm not sure I really understand exactly what's being asked. Uh, so the question was, how do social capital and organisational coalitions interact? Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Sandra. Well, maybe I think that they could interact uh, as a stakeholder, right? Maybe the coalition 
uh, with another organization could interact and could build the social capital. I think so. Yeah, yeah, the same reason. Could reasonable. establish a strong relations, of course. Yeah, I, I mean the view of coalitions, the, the view that coalitions take is that information in organisations isn't perfect um, and that dominant coalitions will act to uh, filter the information that's available in an organisation to their advantage. So that's kind of what I'm, my understanding of a coalition is. So that's, that's, yeah, we need to talk about that probably further down the track. But, yeah, I'll hand back to you, Kristen. Uh, so everyone who's who's in the audience, feel free to, to post a question in the chat if you have any, um, or raise your hand and, and we'll get to your questions. Now, Sandra, I thought I might ask you an, another question, just really just a reflection on um, the research that you've done and your experience. I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in the dimensional approach to social capital that you use, because as you're probably seeing from my work, it's, it's the same approach that I use. And the, the difference between structural, relational and cognitive do you find, first question is, do you find the three dimensions useful or do you tend to prefer just using two dimensions, you know, structural and, and relational or structural and cognitive? I think that you can use the three dimensions. If you can build the social capital. In fact, the, when we build the collaboration node, we build the three dimensions because the women entrepreneurs share the information and they build a, a better performance, of, for example, in their services, in their products. And that permits that the increase, increase the level of sales and innovation too. Yeah. And I feel, I think I feel the same way about it, that I often do use the three dimensions, but um, sometimes I don't feel it's necessary to, to distinguish between relational and cognitive. And sometimes I just use the two dimensions, but I think there is some value in, in using the three. So another question then is like taking that kind of approach, thinking about social capital as, as those three dimensions it is quite different to thinking about social capital as, as, you know, bonding, bridging and linking. Um, types of, of network ties. Do you feel that using the dimensions that you miss anything? Like, do you, do you feel like there's anything that is impo are important determinants of social capital that those dimensions don't actually help us to understand? I think that you you can add, right? The linking bond, the bonding and bridging social capital in, in the proposed uh, theoretical framework of Nahapiel and Gotchel. I think that they maybe missed, right? Yeah, perhaps. Perhaps because if they try to focus in only, sometimes I feel like in, only inside the organization, right? Yeah. But at first, I don't know. Yes, I think that maybe they have to cover this part. Yeah, I think so. And I think that when I go, when I use this, this, the three dimensions approach to social capital, and I think about each of the individual aspects of each of the dimensions, it, it provides quite a useful framework for understanding, you know, what is happening in terms of determinants and consequences of social capital in organisations and in other settings. And I, I guess I, I wonder whether or not by, by, by structuring our thoughts in that way towards those three dimensions, whether there's, there's anything that's important that we actually miss as a result of just focusing in on those three things. And um, something that you've you talked a little bit about in your presentation was you know, the personal characteristics of, of you know, the individuals within an organization. And I, I guess, um, you know, the, the personal characteristics of somebody's, um, you know, ability to develop meaningful relationships, to, to, to have empathy and understand another person's context, you know, that sort of theory of mind. Like these are things that are very important determinants of social capital, but exactly where does that really fit into the dimensional approach? You know, is it, is it things that exist in the structural dimension or the relational or cognitive dimension? You, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it fits in. And I wonder whether or not the, the dimensional approach maybe misses some of those things that are actually quite important. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. 
This is related with the determinants of social capital, Tristan? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, maybe we can analyze uh, in the control. Let me, let me show you. Sure. So I think my, my question or my comment is, is really about, you know, any sort of, um, you know, type framework or typology that we use for understanding a concept, it, it organizes our thoughts into these, these categories or these boxes. And I, I guess I'm just sort of questioning broadly whether or not by organizing our thoughts in those ways, is there anything that we're, we're missing as a result of that? I don't know. I think that in, in fact, they are all the dimensions are related. Yes. And sometimes uh, you need one to exist another. Right? For example, Absolutely. a structural, yes, you need uh, a structural or relational to have the cognitive dimension. I think that they are related and they need, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're dead right. Because of course, it's very difficult to have those sorts of shared it's understandings. Those who put in different boxes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. If you don't have the networks to, to know people, then it's very difficult to have norms as a very simple example. Um, you know, like they're very much related and norms then help to create the sorts of structures that are, you know, so important in the structural dimension. But if you don't have networks, it's difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's a question from David. David, did you want to unmute yourself and, or more of a comment, isn't it? Do you want to unmute yourself and talk to that? Uh, thanks, Tristan. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. In fact, I just um, uh, put something in the chat, which was what you just mentioned, that um, um, there was, um, um, was it Cy and Gosel actually argued that you do need that um, that opportunity to be able to build social capital. It's, you can have those, the three, three aspects, but unless you actually have that opportunity to be able to network and connect, um, uh, you can't actually leverage off those uh, resources that are available in a network. The resources available in the network? Yeah, because uh, to me, I, cause I work, work in organisations as well as, and it's one thing about the, you know, the network is a value, but the network is only a value because you can actually access the resources, you know, the knowledge, the information and resources that you can actually get through the network. And that's what, what, what the real value is. Yes. The assets. Yes, of course. And in fact is one of the, uh, dimension that Matesichet et al. Uh, covers the resources, it's really important because without the resources, you can do anything. Mm. Yes, in the network. That is the, you can, you have to evaluate if exceeds the resources in the network. Mm. Me... So then also does something like diversity become an, a, an aspect as well? Because unless you have diversity, then you're, um, you know, you're all looking at the at the same thing, and you have similar resources. You know, it's that's what um, uh, uh, that, that leads on to, you know, spanning um, uh, those, those structural you... structural holes, so you can ac yes. access um, resources which you wouldn't normally get hold of, and you need diversity for that. Yes, I know that it's difficult to establish one objective for all the stakeholders, right? Mm. You are telling me that I am right? Am I right, David? Oh, sorry, say that again. And... Uh, it's difficult to establish the, the main objective of all the members because they perceive the needs uh, in different ways, right? Mm. Mm. Okay, that is the reason that we applied the Micmac uh, diagnosis. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, because you can focus only in the main problem, and mm. all the members of the group they have to be uh, to accept that they are going to build the project 
to solve that problem. Oh, and that's where it's a, a shared problem that um, people will actually gain value from solving. Yes, and, uh, exactly. Hmm. And or they are um, according to the to establish a project to solve that problem. Hmm. And in the methodological um, methodology provided by Saxer, it's the same. Uh -huh. But they use a different way to take the group and they try to, okay, this is a problem that we are facing now. And now we are going to infer in the future. If all the variables that exist now uh, continue in the time and we can do, uh, we do nothing about it, mm. what happened in the future? And that in that way, Saxer uh, take the group to infer and to see the future. And that is the reason that they want to collaborate. Yeah, yeah, and I can see that that's what binds that group together to, to have that um, shared objective. Um, but then those, those things that bind the group together and the similarities means um, okay. um, to solve the problem, they possibly need a broader network with more diversity into it, which means stepping, reaching outside that network. Okay. Well, for example, the women entrepreneurs are dif in different sectors, all of them. And um, the collaboration now is like a system. And they analyze the capabilities that they have, uh, the different uh, companies that exist and they try to, to to be stronger with the help for the others uh, companies mm -hmm. other thing that they have to do to bond the collaboration cell is they have to see they have to um, spend time together. They spend time together that informal and informal work way. Yeah, to build that bonding. To build that bonding. Yep. And another stuff, the transparency of the information. All they can share the information with one click. Mm -hmm. Okay, and all the information is uh, available to anyone. Okay, so uh, you're getting um, diversity through engaging people in different industries. Exactly. Okay, thank you. For example, one is of uh, information technology, another is about um, plastic and all that is stuff that they were very demand, the, the sector was demanded because the, they need all the um, containers to the sanitizer, all that stuff with COVID-19 and all that stuff. And they build and they build the collaboration self and they could like uh, a small cluster could be. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think what David's actually just identified about the, the importance of diversity and having different um, skills and experience and expertise and perspectives within an organization, that particular important factor of social capital isn't particularly well captured by the dimensions approach. You know, because when you look at the structural, relational and cognitive dimensions, 
I, it's not obvious to me where that sort of diversity fits into the dimensions approach. Um, so I think to me, it's something that is perhaps a little bit overlooked or, or not, uh, not highlighted in the dimensions approach. Um, and I think that, it, like, I find it quite interesting that, uh, you know, Napier and Goschel's uh, conceptual approach to social capital focuses on, you know, structural, relational and cognitive, yet their definition is about the actual and potential resources embedded within networks and within organisations. And yet there's nothing really about their conceptual approach that can take into account those resources, depending on how they define resources, of course, because if they simply define resources as, you know, uh, social or relational resources, such as, um, you know, uh, um, loyalty and, and um and, and social structures, you know, those sort of relational resources, then, then I can understand how it works conceptually. But if we're talking more about uh, resources such as, you know, information and uh, skills and experience and those sorts of things, then it doesn't seem to fit very well with the dimensions approach. Um, not really a question, more of a comment, but your thoughts okay, would be interesting. Okay, okay. okay. But I think that the Nahapiat and Goshal, they used to the flow of information because you can build innovation if you don't have diversity. We, we can, I don't know everything. I need to yeah. uh, establish my network because yeah. if I want to build innovation. And there is that you can find the diversity that you have to establish. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the point David was making as well. I think it's a really important point. Absolutely. I guess I'm just questioning where within the three dimensions of social capital, where Maybe that diversity. Right. Yes. In the cognitive, I think so. In the cognitive uh, dimension. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's possible because um, the cognitive dimension is often defined as being the shared understandings, you know, the, the things of similarity rather than the things that are of difference, you know, the diversity. But I guess that could be included both ways. And they quote about Nonaka and Takeuchi. And they built the innovation framework, a theory of innovation in Japan. And they quote about the uh, explicit and tacit knowledge. The tacit knowledge that you can uh, have interacting with the other people and uh, yes, well, I do know more than Yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree with you completely. So there's a, a question there from Sibigani. Did you want to, you've got your hand up, would you like to unmute yourself? and? Pose a question or a comment? Yeah, I think for me it's more of a comment. I wanted the presenter to shed more light on the issues of governance, where governance into this whole thing of um, uh, social capital. Thank you. I didn't hear you very well, Singapore. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the issue of uh, governance. Uh, governance, governance was um, governance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wanted you to, you to elaborate on the issue of corporate governance, how it fits into the off because that's one area of my interest. There. Thank you. Okay. Well, the, the corporate governance give us the structure, the structure and the norms of the organization follow to obtain the goals, the main goals. And the corporate, corporate governance, uh, the main objective is to, to obtain a sustainable development in the long term of view and with all the stakeholders, all the stakeholders of that have the, the organization. Let me, let, maybe I can explain you. Ah, yes. Well, I have here a graphic that is based, uh, one, one of the theories that it based corporate governance. And let me show you.
is the stakeholder theory. Sorry, I, I didn't bring it and translate it in English, but here you have the organization, but you can develop the, or facing the challenges to, to fight the effects of COVID-19, right? You need all the, you need the, the help of all the stakeholders like clients, community, political groups, inversor, uh, investment, shareholders, government, and employees, etc. And corporate governance promotes the transparency to all the stakeholders. And in that level, you can increase the level of trust. Increasing the level of trust, you can find more collaboration and you can find a highest level of social capital. Maybe I can send you some, uh, well, my master's thesis that is related with corporate governance. And, you, and we can find there the, all the theories and all the, the main objectives and the structures and the types, the different types of, of corporate governance that exist. Yeah, anything that you would like to, to send out to any participants, if you want to send that through to me by email and I can- Yes, of course. I can send that out to all of the participants. Um, Marion, did you have a question? Oh, I have lots of questions. <laughs> so, well, I'm actually refraining from them. I'm trying to type some of them in the question uh, in the, the chat. But I was actually, um, Tristan would be unhappy if I didn't ask a question about habitus. So <laughs> um, getting back to that female entrepreneurs and the results of whether or not they cooperate quite so readily if they were competing in the same or similar industries. So you're sort of saying that they're actually sort of in different industries. So my question becomes, well, they then have to, they then obviously don't have to suppress the natural disposition that they actually have to compete. So our habitus starts to, you know, start to get more questions, but I'm not, I'm not going to ask you too much until I've had a look at Micmac and how that aligns with finding out the dispositions that people have. And then whether but which ones they choose to invoke going forward. So obviously in this case, they have not chosen to invoke competitive dispositions. Do you know what I'm I'm sort of saying? So, but you know, looking at Micmac and that first stage of how people actually assess and assess themselves and how much they're going to invest or block themselves from the situation, both in entrepreneurial and in organizational senses becomes an important question in all of this organizational stuff, yeah. Well, in the collaboration, not, uh, they are from different industries, Yeah. but maybe we are going to build another collaboration not with yeah. uh, another entrepreneurial association mm -hmm. and maybe we have to establish at first, maybe we, when we are doing the diagnosis of Micmac and all that stuff, because maybe they could be in similar industries. Yeah. And have to establish at first in the statement of the project, uh, how are going to manage that, uh, that issue, right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the questions I'm asking are sort of forward, forward thinking questions in terms of um, the organisations and, and actually looking at uh, how you can get those people to cooperate in organisations as well. But anyway, but that's just my dispositions question. But I also had uh, the question yeah. about governance also. Um, and, you know, at some stage, it would be lovely to see, I mean, I'll obviously read your thesis, but um, 
the recommendations you make for governance in, uh, in the transparency of information and all those sorts of things, I think will actually be very important to this research group um, and going forward in terms of the recommendations. Because in my world, I'm actually in looking at corporate governance, but from a strategic perspective. So open corporate governance, including stakeholders in the, the governance of the organisation. Um, is a question that needs to be uh, looked at going forward in the research. But yeah, these are just observations. <laughs> but fascinating. So yeah, you'll have at least one reader of your thesis. But when's it, um, when's it going to be available publicly and stuff? Oh, well, I hope so very quickly. I don't know, <laughs> maybe in a couple of months. I... Oh, good. Excellent. Okay. Yes, to finish all the the findings, to write all the findings yeah. of the research. Yes. We're at a similar point, so that's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So does anybody else have any other questions? Feel free, as I mentioned, to put pop them in the chat or put up your hand if you would like to ask them. Just give yeah. you a Give My only other, other question was how do we drive all of this research out into organisations, Tristan? But that's sort of like the, uh, you know, uh, crystal ball activity. Oh, I think it's, uh, but it is an interesting question. And I, I think I have a similar question too, Sandra, because this is something that we're all very passionate about, but a lot of organisations don't take social capital and these kinds of issues particularly seriously. Some do, but of course some don't. So, you know, that, that question of, do you have any thoughts about how we can get their attention? Well, with the economic, economic social or environmental performance, if we can show that they, we, if they uh, increase the level of social capital in their organisations, they could have, they could they could find uh, a better performance indicators, and I think that in that way, many companies are going to. What are they doing, this group, <laughs> this research group? What are they doing? Yes, I think so. I mean, these are things that, of course, every organisation should should know and they should understand the importance of social capital for their organisation. But I guess a lot don't or they they overlook it and they, they tend to prioritise other things and, and, and other ways to put in their effort. And, and I, I wonder, like, do you have any ways to talk with, with people in organisations about social capital that helps them to understand? You know, like quite often... Social capital is in academic type of language that can be difficult to understand. But do you have any any ways or techniques that you can put it into simple language for people to understand? Yes. Well, I told them that if you increase your level of social capital and you interact or you build a network, you can find and you can face the challenging uh, situation that we are facing. Right. Yeah. I, I think that one person or one uh, businessman can face, cannot face the challenging situation that we are uh, experiencing, right? Yeah, yeah. It's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, because I think, like Marion was saying, I think this is the real challenge is, is trying to communicate this in, in ways that business can understand um, and understand very, very easily. And I think sometimes like when I'm talking about structural and, and relational dimensions, sometimes I talk about, um, you know, structural being um, the people you know and the relational cognitive being the nature of those relationships because I, I think people can understand it very easily in, those, in that kind of terms. Or, or sometimes I talk about structural as being, you know, connectedness, you know, knowing people and being connected to people but the relational and cognitive dimensions being the inclination to then be social. So you can be connected, but you also need the inclination or the predisposition to want to be social. And so I think these are some ideas that I have about ways that we can communicate these fairly academic, uh, academic kinds of concepts in, in ways that maybe people can understand more easily. 
and I guess I'm interested in and your thoughts, but also anybody else in, in, in the audience as well who has any ideas about ways we can communicate these ideas um, simply to people. Yes, I think that maybe the um, entrepreneurs could could feel more comfortable if I have a partner that they or a group of partners that they are helping me and they are providing me information and resources. And I am not working alone, no? the field that I am not working alone. And I think that it, that issue, it's really important. And it can make an enormous difference, just simply knowing that you're working together, like that's a simple shift of, of I'm, I'm working alone and I'm in competition with everybody to, oh, actually, I'm working with other people and we're collaborating. That simple shift in, in attitude can make an enormous difference to people. Exactly. But it, that is the reason that it's really important. If you can see in the process, at first, we focus in the individual, right, uh, in the person because he, the person is free, uh, willing, right? Yeah. And he decides if he wants to collaborate or not. And let me tell you something, Tristan. I think that not all the persons are uh, ready to collaborate. Not all the persons are ready. As you, as Marian, as all the persons that are here, Right. You'd be talking to an, a former human resources manager and sort of talking to people about why the hell they block so much. <laughs> well, and so, Sandra, which, yeah. Sandra, you mentioned um, at the beginning of your presentation about some of the perhaps cultural or historic types of attitudes that exist within Mexico society that maybe yes. have an influence. You know, I think you mentioned, did you mention um, criminality? I think was, was one yeah, of the things the you talked about. Criminality. Uh, out of 140 countries, we are in the place 100, 141 countries, we are in the place 140. Imagine yeah. that. We are tired of that. So, so these, these are the sort of background contexts that, uh, that yeah. provide the challenges, you know, working within organizations, that working with individuals that does an individual really want to start collaborating with another individual when maybe the, the assumption is that there, there's going to be criminality there or there's going to be distrust there, you know, as a sort of a starting point because of that's what exists in society more broadly? And that is the reason that we have to build the social capital from my micro to micro level. And maybe you, you can start with the person that you know, right? maybe um, uh, another entrepreneurs or maybe your friends, I don't know, no? The, the person that you know and that you trust in them. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll have to start from the bottom and, and build those sorts of relationships and change the way society works, you know, on an individual basis within organizations and it can spread from there. So David has his hand up and then we'll, we'll move to Elizabeth after that, David. Yeah, just a quick one. I just uh, remember very clearly the that set of criteria that uh, Robert Putnam put up a couple of uh, months ago about the criteria by which he measures how um, socially connected the US was. It'd be interested to be interesting to apply that um, those measures into Mexico as well. Yeah. Okay, I I didn't hear Putnam. Well, I can say I was in the presentation of Putnam, but yes, I think that maybe we can um, consider to include Ray. Because the, these same issues um, aren't unique to Mexico, of course. You know, I've, I've been talking with some people in Brazil recently who expressed a similar sorts of um, concerns and difficulties about the nature of wider society, particularly distrust. Uh, and I think also, I think Jacob was, gave a presentation some months ago talking about Greece as well and the kinds of levels of, of distrust that exists within society more broadly and the challenges that represents when, uh, you know, trying to change social capital in, in a particular context, you know, within a particular organisation. So I think, you know, these are problems that exist everywhere. I mean, I think in the United States, we could probably talk about the sort of, uh, you know, divisions that exist within society there. Same thing probably in Australia, probably every country in the world has the same sort of challenges. 
Yes, I think so. <laughs> and it does feel, feel a little overwhelming because we kind of do need to start, you know, from the bottom and we need to start. We are to, in the last yeah. place. <laughs> <laughs> we are really worried. Indeed. I am really worried. That is the reason that we have to, to take the responsibility that, that each individual has, right? What yeah. can we do for our society? What can we do with all the knowledge and capability? And I think that the academic approach, we have to show the path of the different alternatives that the society has. Absolutely, and as I was saying before, and then put it into the language that people can really understand, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that is something that social capital needs to continue to work at, is, is helping the academic kinds of concepts that we're talking about to be translated or to be uh, worded into language that can be really useful for people. And maybe we can start to, to try to work with the entrepreneurial sector, with the population, with the society, and maybe open the window to establish or to try to increase the level of social capital. And maybe they can um, uh, experience, experiencing uh, the, the benefits yeah. no, of it. Yeah. Um, David, did you have anything else to add? No. Um, should we move on to Elizabeth? Did you have some comments? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Sandra. I really love your presentation and how clearly you've made everything. Um, for me, the, the practical intervention I'm working on is social accounting, I think, is a way to put social capital on businesses' radar screens, um, showing the benefits of what it oh, does. No. A business model. Um, and it, it also, you know, another benefit is that it teases out which firms have pro social business models and which firms are extractive and have really anti social business models. Um, so that's an intervention. I put a link to a report that could be helpful for if you want oh, to. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. We have here uh, an experimental researcher that. <laughs> could uh, size the impact, right? Yes, absolutely. And then I think that the importance of the integrative thinking, right? So as Tristan said, you know, with Uphoff's idea about the importance of roles and rules. So integrated reporting helps you to look at structural capital aspects, organizational capital, um, and showing how these things can, um, you know, scale across levels, individual, organizational, society for better or worse. Right, so. Um, Elizabeth, do you happen to know who else has, has um, written about Uphoff's ideas of rules, roles, procedures? I really um, don't, Tristan. In fact, I wasn't. it wasn't on my radar screen until you brought it. So thank you for sharing that and I'll check it out. Um, but I think maybe you, you threw down the invitation for us to explore that and you know, integrated reporting and social accounting could be a framework that helps connect those, those pieces. And I think the diversity question is also super important. I'm not sure where that would live in a multiple capitals framework, but somewhere there's a, a room for it. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the question about the diversity, it seems to relate to the outcomes of social capital, but it still seems to have a place within social capital itself. And so, you know, this is one of those really interesting questions that I find about, you know, focusing on resources and how important that is in the outcome sense, but it, it's, it's fundamental to what social capital is really about. But how do we capture that, you know, within the sort of the, the core, you know, conceptual approach to what social capital is? It's a challenge. So just also to extend a little bit about, you know, Norman Uphoff, um, I went through the process, I think it was last year or the year before, just trying to expand on each of the aspects of each of the dimensions of social capital. And, and I was really surprised to find that for some of those aspects that are really frequently listed, like roles and rules and procedures that are frequently listed as aspects of the dimensions of social capital, there was very little really written about them you know, ex expanding and exploring and explaining how they work and what they really mean. Um, and it was the same in the structural dimension with roles and rules, but I also found similar sort of thing within the cognitive dimension with things like shared narratives, um, you know, shared language. Oh, yes, 
so important and so yeah. powerful their narrative, right? Exactly, exactly. So important, but yet not written about a great deal in the context of social capital, you know, within the, within the, the cognitive dimension, which I find interesting. Yes, I don't know where I found the yeah. narrative in the happier language. Shall we? Yeah. yeah, it's in there. It's a little bit in there, but it's it's not explored in you know significant detail. Exactly. Perhaps we can talk about this in the next Q and A session and, and give people the opportunity to read some of Sandra's um, writings by Saxer and Matish. Uh, yes, I can show you that. And also, the I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just suggesting next Q and A, Tristan. That's all. If that's we, a beautiful time. That's a beautiful segue to to the next session. Um, so, <laughs> as as Marion was saying. Our, our next session next week is going to be a, a question and answer discussion session on social capital. So same time on the same day, so uh, Friday of next week. Um, but it's not going to be recorded. It's going to be completely informal. And we're just going to discuss you know, the questions and topics that come up by anyone who attends that session. So everyone's welcome. Um, and you can find that event listed on the website and it'll be on the Facebook and LinkedIn group as well if you'd like to join us. Um, Maybe we, I can share you the, the project, how I built. Yeah, that'd be lovely. And the uh, Mic Mac I can yeah. bring. Ah. It's formal, yes, of course. And maybe Everyone's we, welcome, yeah. Yes, apply to us. Why not? Yeah. Absolutely. Just looking, checking in the chat if there's any other questions that, that people have. Um, yeah. Thanks, Shirley, about that, that. I don't, yeah. you don't have a question in, in amongst that comment, do you, Shirley? No, I didn't have any question. No, thanks. No, but thanks for your comment. Um, so any, any final questions before we, we wrap up? Any final questions or comments? Feel free to put your hand up or pop something in the chat. Before anybody does, I'd like to say thank you, but um, I think driving this forward, we have to concentrate on organisational governance. So I'm actually researching in the not-for-profit sector, but if you actually sort of try and place all of this in the, in the governance literature, I think it's got a little bit more uh, clout is the word I'm looking for, a bit more powerful. So trying to sort of question what goes on in the governance of organisations, and that's what I'm trying to do. But, yeah, and Sarah. Hi. <laughs> All right, so shall we wrap up then um, this session? So uh, as I mentioned, next week we've got the, the Q&A session and we've got a, a fantastic series of webinars coming up in the coming months. So check out the events uh, or the Facebook group for more information about that. So uh, thanks very much, Sandra, for, for presenting today and all the work you've, you've put into preparing for this and all the time you've given us to, to answer questions and discussion. Um, everyone, I'm sure, really appreciates it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tristan. Thank you very much to everyone. It's an honor to be here. Okay. And congratulations again. You are, have done an amazing world work. You, Marianne, and all the members. Thank you so much. Thank you.